What if I were to tell you that I know the reason for everything that has ever happened to you? I know it probably sounds a little bit presumptuous, like I'm 29, I barely know you, but just hang with me for a second. I know the reason for everything that's ever happened to you. The reason that high school girlfriend dumped you back when you were 16, the reason you didn't get that job you really wanted a few years ago, even the reason that you keep having that nightmare about the bicycle, you know, where you're like pedaling downhill and then you hit that ramp and you get that like falling feeling in your stomach and you wake up in a cold sweat. Or, it, okay, that one's just me, nobody else, fine, okay. But still, I know the reason for all of those things. Would you like to know what it is? I, I would presume you would, right? I mean, most of us feel like there's a reason for everything that happens to us. And this is true whether you're a Christian who believes that there is a God who controls the universe and has a reason and a plan. This is true if you are a Hindu who believes in karma and in the balancing out of things. This is true if you are not a religious person but believes in fate and that the universe has a purpose for... All sorts of people believe there's a reason for everything. And I am going to tell you what it is. Or rather, the Apostle Paul is, because he's quite a bit more intelligent than me. But in the book of Romans, chapter 8, the Apostle Paul writes about this idea. And he has an idea for what the reason for everything is. So let's take a look this morning at Romans 8, verses 28 to 30. I'll invite you to follow along on the screen behind me. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, it's a bit of an ambitious task to unpack the reason for everything in a 25 to 30 minute sermon. Uh, when I looked at other pastors who preached on this passage, they sometimes used five sermons, 40 minutes each, just to get through these three verses. So you can thank me later that I'm not going that route. But what that means is there are things in this passage I will not get to. For example, I'm probably not going to talk a whole lot about that big word, predestination which I know is a hugely disappointing thing to you all this morning. The 8 a.m. was very, very bummed. We wouldn't get, wouldn't get into that that early. Um, but really, I just have one main thing I want to do with this text this morning. I want to ask Paul the question, what is the reason for the things that happen to us? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do good things seem to happen to bad people? Why do these random everyday events happen? What is the reason for everything? And Paul, I think, will have an answer for us. If you've been around a church for a while, or even if you're relatively new to the Christian faith, there's a good chance you've encountered the first verse we read this morning. Romans 8:28 is a really popular verse. We see it on the coffee mugs, on the bumper stickers, on the Instagram posts, right? The idea that God works all things for good is a really comforting and happy verse. But the problem is that sometimes we cut off the quote in the middle of the sentence. Like our coffee mug and like our uh, bumper sticker there, we cut the sentence off halfway through if you'll actually go back to that last slide there for me to show my little example here. Uh, we cut it off at all things work together for good. And then we stop the sentence. Now there's a problem when we don't listen to the full sentence. We usually don't get the full meaning. Let's take, for example, the aforementioned high school girlfriend and say that Sally wants to break up with Billy but wants to do it gently. So Sally starts off the conversation with Billy by saying, you know, Billy, I, I really care a lot about you. 
And Billy says, wow, great, that's awesome. And he walks out of the room. Right? Oh no, Billy, Billy, you didn't listen to the full sentence. That's an exegetical fallacy, Billy. But Billy doesn't hear the full sentence and he doesn't get the full meaning. That's the same type of problem we can run into. If we don't get the full sentence, we don't get the full meaning. So now let's go on to the next slide that gives us the full sentence, the full verse. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That's a really important addition. Here's why. If you cut the quote off in the middle and you end it at the word good, the reader gets to define what good means. But God works all things for good, so that must mean, if I didn't get the job I wanted, he must have an even better job in store for me. Sally broke up with me, so that must mean Sally 2.0 is even better in about five years, right? I didn't get the health diagnosis I hoped for, so God must have some other blessing in store for me. Right? If, if we define what is good, we can hear this verse and say, oh, then God must have something good for me in the future, and I know what's good for me. But the problem is that we don't always know what's good for us, do we? We think we know what's good for us, but sometimes were mistaken. A couple years ago, when I was about eight years old, um, think about that one for a bit, uh, I would get a stomach ache once in a while. Right? When we got stomach aches, my dad had this medicine around. Uh, it was like Tums, but it was like these papaya-flavored chewable tablets, and they tasted way better than Tums. Um, and one day I had one of these stomach aches, and it was particularly nagging me, so I decided, hey, look, medicine, right? It's good for you. So I chowed down on like nine of these papaya tablets. Um, and if you have any idea how medicine works, you know how the rest of young Steve's night went, right? I went from having a bit of a stomach ache to being curled up on the couch asking my dad if I was going to die. Uh, it was a very unpleasant night for eight-year-old Steve. And that's the night I learned how medicine works. Turns out you can't pump nine papaya chewable antacids into an eight-year-old stomach because you basically nuke the digestive system. I thought I knew what was good for me. It turned out I wasn't quite on target. Anybody else in the audience who's eight or nine years old listening along right now, this is free advice for you. Don't make the mistake I did. But this doesn't go away when we turn into adults, does it? I mean, how often have we thought something like, oh, if I just get this relationship together, or if I get into this home, or if I have this change happen in my life, or I get this car, or whatever. If I get this, that will be good for me. And then hindsight, five years down the road, shows us, well, maybe I, I didn't actually know what was good for me after all. So, how does God define good in Romans chapter 8? Right? Romans 8.28 says he works all things for good according to his purpose. So, what is his purpose? That's what Romans 8.29 tells us. This is what we've been building up to. This is Paul's answer. This is the reason for everything. For those whom he foreknew, God also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he may be the firstborn among many brothers. That clarify things for everybody? We all tracking now? Right? I frequently talk about how I'm predestined to be conformed to the image of his son at the water cooler, right? This is a normal conversation. This is language that's kind of hard to wrap our brains around. Uh, so let me rephrase it in the RSV, the Revised Steve version, and put this in somewhat more common language. God knew who you were ahead of time. He chose you that you would be made more like Jesus. That's what it means to be conformed to the image of his son, to be made like Jesus. In other words, God's plan for everything that happens to you is to make you more like Jesus. That is the reason for everything. So why did Sally break up with Billy? No, it was to make Billy and Sally more like Jesus. Why did you not get the job that you wanted a few years back? 
Well, it might have been because God had another job for you, but primarily it was to make you more like Jesus. Why do you keep having the nightmare about the bicycle? I don't know how the ins and the outs work, but somehow Paul says it's to make you more like Jesus. That's the reason for everything. Now, some of you might be thinking to yourself, uh, honestly, I'm, I don't think I, I don't know how I feel about that. I didn't sign up for that. To be made more like Jesus? Why couldn't it have been somebody more fun like Tom Hanks or Pastor Brad? Right? Like, be made more like Jesus. Jesus is, he's kind of boring, isn't he? I mean, he's so holy. He reads his Bible. He talks a lot. He teaches a lot. He probably isn't a very good dancer. He's probably not good company at movies. Right? Like, Jesus, I mean, I guess it would be good to be more like him, but it, it sure wouldn't be, sure wouldn't be very fun, would it? So let's, let's explore that idea a little bit. Uh, I want to do an audience participation exercise, which I seem on this kick lately. I don't know where it came from, but it's been a lot of fun. So let's do a little audience participation exercise. I want you to come up with one word to describe Jesus. Think about everything you know about him, everything you've read from the Bible, everything you've listened to from the pastors, everything you know about Jesus, and pick one word to describe Jesus. Okay, you got your word? Everybody got your word? Now I want you to turn to your neighbor. If you don't know them, introduce yourself, find out their name, and tell them your one word to describe Jesus. Go. It was a trick question. You're not supposed to talk in church during the sermon. How? <laughs> the disrespect. No, in sincerity, I would be very curious to hear what some of your answers were. Did anybody say something like Jesus is loving? Loving, compassionate. A lot of people have their hands up. How about friendly or kind or, or nice or something along those lines? Anybody say gentle? That might have been my word, something like gentle. Uh, how about controversial? Anybody pick that one? No? Okay. Boring? Anybody? Boring? No? All right, good. Yeah, you're worried that bull of lightning will jump off the Ten Commandments and come strike you for saying that. But the point I'm trying to get at is when we think about the actual character of Jesus, it's deeply attractive. We gravitate towards it. Jesus, when we really study him in the Gospels, isn't this boring, distant, oh-so-holy figure far off that we wouldn't want to be like. He's actually really dynamic, attractive, and exciting. And Pastor Brad talked about this last week. Do you remember what the first miracle the Apostle John uses to describe Jesus? He starts telling you the story of Jesus, and he says, all right, here's the first thing you need to know. He made 120 gallons of water into fantastic wine. Right, that guy's fun. We want him at the church potluck tomorrow night, right? We want to bring him along. Or what about the story at the end of the Gospel of Luke, the road to Emmaus? There are two disciples walking together who are sad because of everything that happened, Jesus' death, uh, and they don't know about his resurrection. And Jesus shows up and starts walking with these two disciples, and they don't realize it's him. And he asks why they're so sad, and they say, well, haven't you heard about the things that happened in Jerusalem? And Jesus literally responds, I kid you not, go look it up in Luke. He responds, what things? Like, tell me more. It's, it's playful. It's sarcastic. It's fun. Jesus, if you really look at the Gospels and put away the, sometimes the Renaissance art image we can get of Jesus, he, he's playful. He's fun. He's laughing. He's clever. He's kind. He sticks with his values. He brings in the outsider. Jesus touched and changed more lives than any human being that walked this earth for the good. To become more like Jesus would make you into the best possible version of yourself. I've heard it said before, and I've probably quoted it already, but I'll say it again, that in essence, the main question of the Christian life is, if Jesus were me, what would he be like? If Jesus were a 29-year-old guy with a wife and a puppy in southwest Florida, what would his life be like? And how can I become more like that? That's the essential question of being a follower of Jesus. 
And that, Paul says, is God's purpose for everything. It's to make you into the image of Jesus. That is what's behind a Greek word Paul uses to get at this image. I won't make you pronounce it. You've already done your audience participation for the day. But the word Paul uses is a Greek word called sumorphos. If you look at that, you can see an English word is kind of hidden in there, the word morph. To morph is to change form into something, right? A, a caterpillar metamorphosizes into a butterfly. So to morph, Paul is getting at this idea that when you spend time with Jesus, when you follow Jesus, the goal is that you would become more like Jesus, Right? If you want to become a realtor, what do you do? You go follow another realtor around and learn how to be a realtor, and you become a better realtor. It's the same idea, except it actually goes much, much deeper in Christianity. Before the word morph, Paul uses this prefix, sum. And sum means with or together. Paul uses this to describe how if you're a believer in Jesus and you're unified with him, then you are crucified with Jesus. Buried with Jesus. You'll be risen with Jesus. And here, the literal rendering of the word would be, you will be formed into the same form as Jesus. You'll be formed together with Jesus. So in a way, yes, this talks about how God will make us more like Jesus on this earth. Make us more gentle, more kind, more loving. But the ultimate form of Jesus was not the human that the disciples saw on earth. The ultimate form of Jesus was the glorified, resurrected human Jesus, ruling the cosmos eternally with God. And Paul says, that is what God is forming you into. In other words, God's purpose for everything that happens to you is to gradually shape you bit by bit into the eternal, resurrected, glorious, co-ruling being of the entire cosmos with Jesus. That is a pretty cool purpose, if you ask me. Now, we could go away and take that as a really significant encouragement, but it also begs another question, doesn't it? There's sort of an elephant in the room I've been ignoring so far. I said we were only going to talk about one question today, but it's only 10.30, so we've got time for a second one. Um, the first question we talked about was, what is the reason for everything? And we said, all right, the answer is to become more like Jesus. That's how God is at work in our lives. But that begs a second question, and here it is. Does that include the really, really bad things? Sure, okay, I can accept that Sally broke up with me back in high school to make me more like Jesus, but what about, what about the worst traumas I endured in my childhood? Or what about the broken relationships and divorces that are haunting my present? Or what about the wildfires in Maui or the hurricane in California or the fallout we're still dealing with from Hurricane Ian? Does God use even those really, really, really bad, atrocious things for good? To make us like Jesus? My guess is that the Christians Paul was writing to probably had the same question. Paul wrote this letter to the Romans. The astute among you might conclude that these are Christians who live in Rome. Rome was not an easy place to be a Christian in the first century. For one, it was a place full of other gods and goddesses, so you were surrounded by all sorts of pagan religion. For another, there was a cesspool of vice and temptation Morality was all over the place, so you were surrounded by temptation to all sorts of things. To add to that, the emperor Claudius, a few years back, had expelled the Jews. He kicked them out of Rome. So when they came back, there was some division and some uh, disagreement between the Jewish Christians and the non-Jewish Christians. And to put a cherry on top of the messy ice cream sundae, the guy who was in charge of Rome at this point was a fellow named Nero. Nero, if you don't know much about him, is not the type of guy you want watching your kids while you're gone for the weekend. <laughs> Among Nero's reputation included such items as assassinating his own mother, being full of moral depravity, and setting the city of Rome on fire and blaming the Christians for it, thus igniting a centuries-long persecution. Now, 
scholars and historians have their debates on how much of Nero's story is true and how much is myth and legend. But the reality still stands that it was during and after Nero's time that a massive persecution broke out against Christians in Rome. And Nero's in charge when Paul writes this letter in 57 AD. In other words, the Roman Christians are asking the same exact questions we are. And if we are to, uh, to hear from church tradition, church tradition has it that seven or eight years after writing this letter in 64 or 65 AD, the Apostle Paul would find himself under the guillotine in Rome, under the rule of Nero, about to be beheaded for his Christian faith. Do you think Paul, eight years after writing this letter, still believed God works all things for good? I think he did, and here's why. Back in Romans 8, verse 17, this is one of the verses Paul uses to transition into the section we read this morning. And Paul writes, we are fellow heirs, that's the soon prefix again, heirs together with Christ. We're going to receive a resurrection body like Jesus. We're going to be glorified like Jesus. Heaven's not going to be playing a little harp on your cloud. Okay, no, nobody wants to be near my heaven harp cloud because I have no musical talent. So I hope that's not what heaven is like. Heaven is going to be reigning eternally over the cosmos with Jesus, enjoying the beauty of a new creation with no more sin or tears or pain. It's beautiful. It's exciting. And those of us who are really good at harps will be able to continue enjoying such things. Well, the rest of us musically ungifted people, who knows what will happen to us? We'll find out. But the point is, heaven's a beautiful, glorious thing. But Paul says, we earn that, or rather, we receive that, provided we suffer with him. Back to the previous slide for a second, please. Provided we suffer with him in order that we might also be glorified with him. In other words, obtaining that glory, receiving that glory is tied to suffering with Jesus. I believe Paul's argument would not just be that when we go through bad things, they also make us like Jesus. I think his argument would be going through bad things makes us more like Jesus than anything else. This is written by a man who knows what it's like to suffer. Right? Paul had been shipwrecked. He had been stoned. He had been backstabbed. He had been abandoned. But he also knew that his Savior, Jesus, knew what it was like to be backstabbed by a dear friend. Jesus knew what it was like to go through physical abuse and anguish. Jesus knew what it was like to feel like God had left and was nowhere nearby. Paul's argument is that the bad things aren't outside the purview of God's purpose. If you are going through suffering right now, then the purpose for that is to make you like Jesus too. And it's not as though God is some maniacal tyrant that's looming over you from heaven saying, oh, I know what Pastor Brad really needs right now. Let me throw a trauma down on him and that'll make him like Jesus. No. I love the way Christian author Johnny Erickson Tata phrased it, a woman who suffered paralysis as a result of a diving accident. She said, sometimes God uses what he hates to accomplish what he loves. The suffering you are undergoing right now it's not something that God is happy you are experiencing by no means. But there is a purpose for it. He's shaping you more and more into the image of his son. How can we be sure of that? How can we know that that's what God is up to? That's what comes up in verse 30. Our next verse that will pop up on the slides here. Paul says, here's how you can know that this is the reason for everything. Those whom God predestined, he also called. Those whom he justified, he also, oh sorry, those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, this word predestination, it can be a big hairy one that throws all sorts of theological quandaries out there. If you're not familiar with the word, the, the basic idea is that something God predestined is something he destined ahead of time or chose in advance would happen. So Paul is saying, if you're a believer in Jesus, God shows that you would believe in Jesus before you even walk the earth. Now that's encouraging, but it also brings up a lot of questions. If God shows me, does that mean he didn't choose others? If God shows me, then why am I held responsible for my own decisions? 
And these are all really good questions. We're not going to devote a lot of time to getting into them today, but if you have some of those questions, what I'd encourage you to do is later on this week, walk on down to our office hallway, come on down to the end of the wing where my office is, then turn around and walk straight across the hall through Pastor Stephen Grant's office, and you can ask him any question you have. I'm sure he'll answer it well for you. I didn't ask him for permission to do that, so we'll see how it goes this week. But in sincerity, there are questions that arise when we talk about this big predestination word. My dad phrased it well to me when I was a kid. Maybe I was feeling really eternally motivated after my papaya tablet incident. And I asked him about predestination. And he said, Steve, the Bible tells us that God is in control of and chooses everything. And it tells us that we are responsible for our own choices. And then the Bible shuts up and walks away. <laughs> it doesn't answer all our questions. But here's what it does do. Paul uses this idea that God is in control, chose you ahead of time, loved you before you existed as a humongous encouragement. Theologians call this passage the golden chain. In other words, once you get into one link on the chain, you're not getting back out of it. If God shows that you're going to be saved through Jesus, he's God. He's not going to fail. You're going to be a follower of Jesus. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you're going to be justified and forgiven by Jesus. And if you are justified by Jesus and received his righteousness because of his death on the cross and resurrection for you, then you better believe you're going to be reigning over the cosmos in eternity with Jesus. There's no other possible result. He will make you like Jesus now and forever and there's nothing you can do about it. It's not on you. When my wife and I were on vacation a couple years ago, we happened to stop in at a glass blowing studio in Vermont. They have a glass blowing studio in Vermont, believe it or not. I was surprised. But glass blowing, if you haven't encountered it before, is this mesmerizing art. Uh, the, the glass blower takes this misshapen hunk of glass that doesn't look special at all and sticks it into this multi-thousand degree forge. And as the glass is heated and undergoes the stress and the pain of the heat, it gradually begins to become moldable and pliable. And the glass blower takes the glass out of the forge and is able to shape it into the image they had in their minds to turn it into something beautiful. It's the heat of the forge that makes the glass moldable into the image the master glass blower has in mind. And in the same way, Paul tells us the bad things in our lives, the suffering, the pain, and the anguish we experience is the forge God uses to shape us more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. That means on this earth, becoming more gentle, more loving, more kind, yes. But it also means that your end result is a glorified, resurrected body in eternity with Jesus. And it doesn't depend on you to get there. No matter who you are, where you've been, or what you've done, if you've believed in Jesus as your savior, you're on the golden chain. That's your final result. It doesn't depend on you. So, what do we do with this profound truth? All right, God's going to make me more like Jesus. What do I go do the rest of today about it? Let me give you a few ideas. Firstly, one of the ways that I think this passage impacts us is it gives us a new perspective on our present suffering. Reality is most of us have stuff going on in our lives right now that we're not a huge fan of. But Paul, in Romans 8, verse 18, says, I consider our present sufferings not even worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. And this is coming from a guy who, right, has been shipwrecked, stoned, and will soon be beheaded. So he knows what he's talking about. Paul says, if you have a perspective on your present suffering and realize the present doesn't last forever, that gives you the fortitude to get through it because you know what the end game is. Secondly, I think it gives us a new approach to the present challenges we're dealing with. Uh, if God's purpose for everything is to make you more like Jesus, then that changes how you interact with people when you don't get the job you want, right? Instead of saying, oh, God must have a different job in mind and I'm gonna work hard to get there and I'm gonna figure it out and I'm gonna wait on God to show me his reason. Instead, it makes you say, if I didn't get the job I want, how is God trying to make me more like Jesus? How is he inviting me to be more patient? How is he inviting me to be more generous? 
How is he inviting me to be more mindful of others? Right? I wish I'd had this in my mind when I made the terrifying choice to try to reset my PIN code the other day, and I got stuck on the automated uh, voicemail for my bank for like the entire day, and I was ready to like rip out my hair and the hair of anybody near me until I remembered I was preaching this darn sermon today, and even this automated bank line is a chance for me to become more like Jesus. But what if that were our mindset for everything we experience? Finally. I think it's an invitation for us to have a new peace because of the future confidence that we have. I'm a real big Atlanta Braves fan, which has been going really well for me lately. The Atlanta Braves lead all of baseball in comeback victories. So when I'm watching an Atlanta Braves game, like last night, and it's the eighth inning, and they're down five to four, I'm a little bit of a nervous wreck. My wife can testify to this. I'm there on the couch cheering and saying things that obviously the players can't hear, but if I say it, it might help. Who knows? And there I am, engaged and excited and panicky and a little bit all over the place. And then finally, Eddie Rosario hits the two-run home run and puts away the Giants, and I'm losing my mind. But if I'm watching a replay of the game, a recap, and I already know the end result, I'm just sitting there on the couch, calm as can be, with a smug look on my face. It doesn't matter if they're down by three in the ninth inning. I know they're going to win. The only question is how. I know the end result, and I just get to watch who comes up with the big hit tonight. And that is the perspective we get to go into our days with as Christians. You know the end result. You know that God will stop at nothing to make you more like Jesus Christ. In this world and in the world to come, you get to go into your week and find out how he's going to do it. It will be a lot more pleasant if you cooperate. (laughs) But you get to go find out how he'll make you like Jesus today. So let's pray and invite him to continue his work to that end. Lord God, you have promised to make us into the image of your son. The most loving, inclusive, kind, caring, generous soul that's walked this planet. We long to be more like him. Help us become more like him on this earth, but also remind us that no matter what we encounter, that you are not out to get us, you are out to bless us, and you will stop at nothing to shape us into the glorified, resurrected image of your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.